what to read if you're lost in the woods. That is the theme of my live tonight. I'm going to be talking about books that describe being lost in the woods and also perhaps what books you might like to have with you if you are lost in the books. I was I, lost in the <laughs> lost in the woods, not lost in the books. Obviously, being lost in the books is better than being lost in the woods. So I started thinking about this topic and I did have a quick look about what you're meant to do if you are lost in the woods. And a few useful hints, obviously have water with you, um, have a torch with you. That is very important if ever you're going hiking. Tell people where you're going, pretty damn important, so that if you do get lost, someone's going to come looking for you. Just getting a bit of health and safety here first before we start talking about books. One of the most important things to bring with you, apart from a torch and water, is also a mirror. Because if you are lost in the woods and someone's looking for you, a mirror can deflect the sunlight to those helicopters slash aeroplanes that are looking for you. And apparently that mirror can send sunlight up to 10 kilometres away. So that is a very useful tip. I would not have thought of that. Always put a mirror in your backpack along with your water, maybe some energy tablets, a few Hershey bars and your trusty torch, as well as a book. And what book will that be? Well, we're going to get to that later. But first, I'm going to talk about a few books that are about being lost in the woods. And hopefully I can read by torchlight. Uh, by the way, tonight may be a slightly shorter than usual session because I do still have a bit of a cold. And I've got a live event tomorrow night in London with Natalie Haynes at the London Library. Um, there might still be a few tickets left, I do believe but it might actually be sold out. That's at the London Library tomorrow night between 7 and 8.30 with Natalie Haynes and I'm going to be putting her under the covers um, and giving her a live bibliotherapy session. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with her fantastic books. For instance, Stone Blind and A Thousand Ships, which are some of my favourites. I am in a cave laughing. John, it's great to see you here this evening. Um, that was another tip that I discovered when I was looking up what you're meant to do if you're lost in the woods, um, as well as having your torch and your mirror and water and some Hershey bars. The best place to go apparently is to try and find a cave, though of course you have to look out for other inhabitants of the cave before you make yourself too cosy. And if you can't find a cave, it's also worth looking for a pine tree with fronds of pine branches going down, which will create a kind of a cave where you can sleep the night and you'll also have a bed of pine needles. So that's a good tip. Um, and before anyone gets too deeply into this whole topic, Always make sure you pack your backpack and tell people where you're going. Don't just go hiking without letting people know, even though you want to be independent. It's the, You always hear terrible stories, particularly in novels, of people that didn't tell anyone where they were going. So, getting lost in the woods. It's a great topic. There's a lot of fantastic books about it, uh, from fairy tales to horror stories to grown-up novels um, and also survival books too. So I know I'm not going to be able to cover it all tonight. And I started thinking about it because me and my daughter Calypso go running um, practically every day, often in the woods. And it's very easy to imagine getting lost in the woods. And sometimes we do, but never for a whole night. So I'm going to start off with a really exciting and scary book, which is the Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon by Stephen King, um, which was written, I think, in about 2002. And it's all about a family hiking trip during which the heroine, who's nine, um, and she's called Trisha, goes 
off hiking with her family and her parents are bickering all the time because they're on the verge of a divorce or they might have even just got divorced not absolutely sure and because the little girl age nine doesn't want to hear her parents bickering she drops back from uh where they're walking on the forest trail and she wanders off the trail to take a bathroom break and then of course she loses her family and she tries to catch up by attempting a shortcut fatal move of going off the path never go off the path as you know from little red riding hood one of the first ever getting lost in the books lost in the woods books that you probably ever read never go off the path you know it's a disaster if you do but off she does go off the path and she's going deeper and deeper into the heart of the forest and all she has is a bottle of water two twinkies this is america a boiled egg celery sticks a tuna sandwich pretty good haul of stuff but really for many a person who's lost in the woods a bottle of surge a poncho that's handy as well I've got my handy poncho, by the way, just like you to notice that I'm actually really well equipped for my night in the forest. Um, and a Walkman. I think it was set in the 90s. So she listens to her Walkman to keep her mood up and to try and listen out for news of the search for her. She, it's got a radio and she can also listen to the baseball game featuring her favourite player and heartthrob, Tom Gordon, which is why this novel is called The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Oh, I've just seen it was published in 1999, by the way. So she starts taking steps to survive by conserving her food. Classic move. She's only nine, but she knows what to do. Her family return to the car without her, realise she's not there, and start a search. Call the police. The police go off looking for her and they don't find her um she heads off going in deeper and deeper into the woods and it's still soon turning into a swamp like river i'm obviously not going to tell you what happens hours and days pass and she still hasn't been found and she starts hallucinating so that is uh the girl who loved tom gordon by stephen king who of course is one of the greatest writers of horror fiction and scary fiction you know that you're, you're in good hands with Stephen King and that is a book that gets rave reviews however that book by Stephen King is not as scary as Teeny Tiny and The Witch Woman sorry Instagram people I still have not worked out how to flip that screen so you're getting it backwards this book which looks innocently uh, short and for young children, is one of the most terrifying books I've ever read. We used to read it to our kids. I was talking about, about it to them today. They're still completely traumatised. It's an absolutely terrifying book. Look at those incredible pictures by Michael Foreman who's an amazing illustrator, who's actually done all sorts of incredible books, which um, are mostly far less terrifying. He also happens to be the neighbour of my brother in London, which is quite awesome and fabulous. And he's just an absolute genius. Look at that. Come on. Is that not one of the most terrifying pictures you've ever seen? And obviously... You would not be drawn in if you had any sense by that absolutely appalling looking witch. But the three children in this book are drawn in because they inevitably get lost in the woods and they end up in the witch woman's house. And I'll just show you a few other pictures. I've got to take my gloves off because it's just all getting a bit too hot and difficult to share these with you. But this book, Teeny Tiny and the Witch Woman, Fantastic book about getting lost in the woods and then these three kids end up in the house of the terrifying witch woman. And I just want to show you the actual house, what it looks like, because it's got a really great fence made out of bones, which I want to show you because it's deeply disturbing. And now I can't find that picture, which is going to be really upsetting. Oh, I've got it. Here it is. So look at that. 
utterly terrifying house in the middle of the terrifying woods and the fence is made of bones. You would not go into that house if you had any sense. That's a fabulously scary getting lost in the woods book um, which I just had to share, share with you. And then talking of children's books, there's a few more that I want to share with you um, other getting lost in the woods. So there's obviously the, the Grim Tales. This is a really brilliant collection by Philip Pullman and many a tale in this, which has, I believe, 52 short stories in it, which are versions of um, the original, the classic Grim Tales. Lots of these are about getting lost in the woods too. Um, viewing all sorts. He hello. Great to see you here. Um, you're saying that you love Michael Foreman. Isn't he incredible? And generally not at all scary. I agree. But in that instance, utterly terrifying. I've actually never seen any others that are so scary by him. So check out The Grim Tales if you don't know them by um, Philip Pullman. Then another fantastic book to read if you love stories of getting lost in the woods are uh, Angela Carter's Book of Fairy Tales. So this is a collection of fairy tales from around the world, and it's a really wonderful compilation. Lots of them are quite short, you see, only a couple of pages, and they also have lovely illustrations. And they're all based on original stories from Russia, India, Iran, Europe, Italy, um, all over the place. And they're the original stories told as they first were. So they're quite often fairly short and blunt and not very um, polished in a way. But then on the other hand, Angela Carter is an amazing writer. So she makes them sound fantastic, even though she's giving the sort of unexpurgated version. Talking about Angela Carter, of course, we must also mention The Bloody Chamber, which is an absolutely fantastic collection of books um, sorry, short stories based on fairy tales, often relating to getting lost in the woods as well. So there's the Little Red Riding Hood story, but which is in that collection of short stories by Angela Carter, The Bloody Chamber. Um, but they are the adult version, essentially. So they're absolutely terrifying. They have sex, death, blood, horror rape and uh, wolves who are representing men. So Angela Carter, check her out. Both this one, brilliant collection of fairy tales, which you can read to kids of all ages, but you should always check out the stories first because quite a lot of them are actually very adult. And then The Bloody Chamber, which I don't have to hand because I lent it to my daughter. That's a great one as well, which I would thoroughly totally recommend and lots of them are quite long maybe 50 pages the title story the bloody chamber is uh, a version of the bluebeard tale but modernized by angelo carter in a brilliant way and i just love the ending of that book that's not really a getting lost in the woods one but then her versions of uh Little Red Riding Hood at the end of the book are oh, absolutely brilliant. So that's Angela Carter. Then other fantastic children's books before we move back to the adult books. Tinder by Sally Gardner. This is a wolfy book and of course when you start thinking about getting lost in the woods, wolfy books very much come up into your mind. And this is a really wonderfully frightening brilliantly written and actually quite grown up kind of story which has a lot of grown up themes in it despite it looking more like a children's book. Um, it's probably great for kind of 13 and up, maybe 12 and up, but um, it's a brilliantly written story. Sally Gardner, love her, Tinder, great novel um, with quite a lot of uh, woody moments. Then another one which um, it might be less familiar because she's not so well known. 
Summer and Bird. This is an incredibly complex and brilliantly written story by Catherine Catlaw, which is about two sisters who essentially do get lost in the woods. Um, they're called Summer and Bird. And I'll just read you a little bit about from the beginning of it to give you a flavour. When their parents disappear in the middle of the night, a cryptic picture message from their mother leads young sisters, Summer and Bird, through a familiar gate and into the woods, where the sad electric song of a tiny patchwork bird draws them down. In this ruined, frozen world of birds, their divided hearts will lead them in very different directions in a quest towards united goals. Vanquish the ravenous bird-swallowing puppeteer, help the birds find their way back to their true home, and reveal the true heir to the Swan Queen's throne. But when the border of the bird's home is finally in sight, the world of down will turn in on itself, demanding a sacrifice and threatening the fate of all who live there. This is a really amazing book, which I first read when um, Susan and I were writing The Story Cure, which is our book uh, all about children's books. And it's a really complex, fascinating, brilliant book full of metaphors and uh, metamorphosis, which I would thoroughly recommend. And it mostly does take place in the woods. So also thinking about getting lost in the woods, The Lord of the Rings is always a classic where there's a lot of scenes of... Um, hobbits getting lost in the woods and encountering terrifying creatures such as giant spiders um, and that's obviously also another great getting lost in the in the woods book for kids and there are so many more I'd love to know if you have particular favorites um, or ones that terrify you and we will soon also be getting on to what books you would read if you were lost in the woods and I'd love to know if you'd have books that might comfort you in that situation. So here's a few more um, horror story type getting lost in the books, L lost in the woods um, ideas. So Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky. This is one of those classic stories of going into the woods and coming out without any memories of what happened uh, this is what happens to the imaginary friend. Seven-year-old Christopher is settling into life in a new town with his single mother. Then, one day, he vanishes into the woods. Six days later, he returns seemingly unharmed. But now he can hear a voice that no one else can. And he's obsessed with completing a mission that only he understands. Convinced that if he doesn't succeed, everyone in town will be in grave danger. This is a page turner that will keep you guessing to the very end. So that is Imaginary Friend by Stephen Chbosky. Then there's another one with a similar theme of memory, memory loss, The Woods by Vanessa Savage. This is a powerful mystery thriller about the complexities of memory. Tess remembers a lot of things from her childhood that she wishes she could forget, but all of these bad memories are nothing compared to the one thing she can't remember. The night her sister died in the woods near their childhood home. Tess was the only witness to what was eventually deemed an accident. Years later, having done her best to put her trauma behind her, Tess gets a sudden call from her father. She returns to the woods where her sister's body was found to confront the memories she thought she'd lost forever. So that's another classic um, Getting Lost in the Woods story by Vanessa Savage. Um, we've also got quite a lot of non-fiction based on Getting Lost in the Woods. So I'm kind of dotting around the non-fiction and, and the fiction. There's uh, a non-fiction book called The Cold Vanish by John Billman, which is an account of those who go missing in the wilderness in America without a trace. Journalist John Billman tells a compelling story about the surprising number of people who vanish while hiking in national parks. Does that happen in England? I bet it happens a lot less often. But you do hear about it in places around the world and in Europe. It happened in Ithaca 
when I was on that island not so long ago, a man went missing while hiking through the forest. Ithaca has a different kind of forest to the forest we might be imagining tonight. I'm thinking more of pine forests and big, dark, deep, cold forests. Ithaca is more of a olive grove kind of place, but it does have forests. So uh, the book, The Cold Vanish, revolves around the story of a man who disappeared in the Olympic National Park and his father's lifelong search to find him. And Billman weaves many other tales into the narrative of those who go missing and those who search. Uh, back on the English side of things, we got In a Dark, Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. Leonora, known to some as Lee and to others as Nora, is a reclusive crime writer. Classic. Um, unwilling to leave her nest of an apartment unless it's absolutely necessary. When a friend she hasn't seen or spoken to in years unexpectedly invites Nora to a weekend away in an eerie glass house deep in the English countryside, she reluctantly agrees to make the trip. 48 hours later, she wakes up in a hospital bed, injured but alive, with the knowledge that someone is dead. Wondering not what happened, but what have I done, Nora tries to piece together the events of the past weekend. That's a great concept for a book, isn't it? In a Dark, Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. And Ruth Ware is a famous English writer who has written a lot of fantastic detective-style thriller novels. So, like Stephen King, you know you're in safe hands with her for a scary read. The Forgotten Girls by Sarah Bladell is about uh, people finding the body of an un unidentified woman discovered in a remote forest. A large, unique scar on one side of her face should make identification easy, but nobody has reported her missing. Louise Rick, the new commander of the missing persons department, waits four long days before pulling off a risky move. She releases a photo of the victim to the media which jeopardises the integrity of the investigation in the hopes of finding someone that knows her. The gamble pays off when a young woman recognises the victim as Lisa Metty, a child she cared for in a state mental institution many years ago. Lisa Metty was a forgotten girl, hence the title, abandoned by her family and left behind in the institution. But Louise soon discovers something even more disturbing. Lisa Metty had a twin and both girls were issued death certificates more than 30 years ago, which is highly sinister. That's The Forgotten Girls by Sarah Bladell, which you can imagine is going to be a terrifying read. Another one, so many Lost in the Woods books, and I'd love to know if you, by the way, have your own personal faves. Do let me know. These Silent Woods by Kimmy Cunningham Grant. For eight years, Cooper and his young daughter Finch have lived in isolation in a remote cabin in the northern Appalachian woods. That's exactly the way Cooper wants it because he's got a lot to hide. Finch has been raised on the books. That's a good sign. Filling the cabin shelves and the beautiful but brutal code of life in the wilderness. But she's starting to push back against the sheltered life Cooper has created for her classic survival story and he's still haunted by the painful truth of what it took to get them there. The only people who know they exist are a mysterious local hermit called Scotland and Cooper's old friend Jake who visits each winter to bring them food and supplies but this year Jake doesn't show up setting off in an irreversible chain of events that reveals just how precarious their situation really is. Suddenly the boundaries of their safe haven have blurred when a stranger wanders into their woods. Finch's growing obsession with her could put them all in danger. After a shocking disappearance threatens to upend the only life Finch has ever known, Cooper is forced to decide whether to keep hiding or finally face the sins of his past. Now that's a really interesting, um, great concept for a book. And I just want to point out that it does have quite a lot in common with... Our Endless Numbered Days by Claire Fuller, which is a fantastic read, which I utterly recommend to anyone 
that has not yet had the joy of reading it. This is also about a man and his daughter living in the middle of the woods in Germany. And I won't tell you why they're living in the middle of the woods or what happens in the book, but it's a, a large part of the book takes place with them in their cabin in the middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere, surviving together very happily until things start to change. And I won't tell you why, but Claire Fuller, amazing author. We love her. She's written all kinds of fantastic novels. She's just written a new one, which I was talking about last week, which is called The Memory of Animals, which stars an octopus. Um, and this is the first one of hers that I ever read, and it is indeed a brilliant novel. I think it's her debut novel as well. Um, so do read that. And another one that that story reminds me of is also uh, My Absolute Darling by Gabrielle Talent, which is another fantastic book set in the woods with another father and his daughter living in the middle of nowhere in a cabin in the woods, surviving against the world, trying to stay remote and undiscovered by the world. And they have a bit of a sinister relationship, it has to be said. Um, so that is also an amazing and brilliant read, but quite an uncomfortable one at times. Moving on to some other Lost in the Woods type novels, Will Dean, if you haven't discovered him as a writer, he's a really excellent um, detective writer who does live in Norway in the middle of the woods himself. You can follow him on Instagram and see him talking about where he lives. Um, he actually is, I believe, originally British, but he went off to live in Norway in the middle of the woods where he's writing novels which were all set then. He's written Dark Pines, Red Snow and three or four others in the series and they're brilliant. I've read the first three and I'm trying to read the other ones where and they all um, star a detective who's a really fantastic character who's deaf, a female detective and she is just an excellent and really enjoyable person to hang out with. Um, she's hyper alert to her surroundings because in a way of her deafness and all of these stories take place in the Swedish forest, sorry it's Swedish not Norwegian, where the moose wander by and eat your crops and in all of these novels there's someone who's out for murder. So that's Will Dean, Dark Pines and Red Snow and you can keep going with those because there's several in the series. Another one from Finland is Antti Tuomanin's The Man Who Died, which also takes place in the woods. It's not so much a Getting Lost in the Woods book, but it is another great novel where there's a lot happening in the forest. Um, in the forest, you should be careful of eating the plants and berries. Take a care of the mushrooms, particularly after reading The Man Who Died, as the clue is in the title. Um, and he normally sets his novels around Helsinki, but in this book, The Man Who Died, he wanted to revisit the woods of his youth, and he decided to add in a bit of darkness and murder into the mix. So check that out, The Man Who Died. That's a really good read too. Um, moving on to non-fiction. A book that I have mentioned before on one of these sessions is A Whole Life by Robert C. Teller, which is a um, quite a small novella. And that would be one of the ones that I would say would be great to have with you in your backpack if you go hiking in the woods, because it's actually um, a very easy to carry book, being quite small and light and short. Um, but it's also very comforting because it tells the tale of an ordinary life lived out quietly by the mountains. Um, and it all takes place basically on the slopes of one particular mountain. And it does indeed describe the life of one man. But it's really beautifully written and it's a lovely novella. Here's a quote from it. You can buy a man's hours off him. You can steal his days from him or you can rob him of his whole life. 
but no one can take away from any man so much as a single moment. That's the way it is. It's a very wise, profound and beautifully written book, A Whole Life. Um, moving on to a couple of other uh, non-fiction books. Sorry, that was fiction. Or was it a memoir? I think it's, I'm pretty sure it is actually fiction, but based on perhaps reality. The Last American Man by Elizabeth Gilbert. In 1977, age 17, Eustace Conway left his family's comfortable suburban home to move to the Appalachian Mountains and to be self-sufficient. For more than two decades, he's lived there making fire with sticks, wearing skins from animals he's trapped and trying to convince Americans to give up their materialistic lifestyles and return with him back to nature. This is Elizabeth Gilbert's tale of his story, which toes the line between man and myth. It was published during her time at GQ magazine in 2002, before the explosion of Eat, Pray, Love fame, four years later. And it was nominated for the National Book Award in non-fiction. So Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, um, she wrote this book, The Last American Man, before the great fame of Eat, Pray, Love. Um, and I have to say, I love her book that she wrote after Eat, Pray, Love as well, which is The Signature of All Things, which is a, another book very much about nature. And I do think she is a writer who writes brilliantly about nature. The Signature of All Things is about um, Darwinism. And it's about a woman scientist who was the precursor to Darwin. Um, and quite a lot of it is set in Tahiti, but this book, The Last American Man, does sound brilliant. And here's a quote from it. I live in nature where everything is connected, circular. The seasons are circular. The planet is circular. And so is the planet around the sun. The course of water over the earth is circular, coming down from the sky and circulating through the world to spread life and then evaporating up again. I live in a circular teepee and build my fire in a circle. The life cycles of plants and animals are circular. I live outside where I can see this. The ancient people understood that our world is a circle, but we modern people have lost sight of that. Tracy, good to see you here this evening. Thanks for joining us from Florida. Um, I'm scared myself, I have to say. I was preparing for this earlier this evening and getting completely freaked out by the idea of being lost in the woods. Luckily I do have my torch and I have got my um, special hood and a little bit of high vis on my jacket but then um, my daughter suddenly came up behind me and absolutely terrified me because I have very much got into the feeling of being lost in the woods which is very easy to do to get that freaked out feeling. I wonder if any of you have watched The Blair Witch Project which is an incredibly frightening horror film and I watched it with my husband when we lived in a tiny cottage in the middle of the woods in Hertfordshire just north of London and it was utterly terrifying to watch that film when we lived in the middle of the woods and it's all set in the woods and it's all about getting lost in the woods and it's just completely and utterly one of the most scary films I've ever seen but it's actually very easy to get even more scared by reading a book about being lost in the woods and I think the Stephen King book that I mentioned at the beginning might be the scariest one that I've talked about tonight other than Teeny Tiny and the Witch Woman, which is a children's book, but completely and absolutely sends shivers down your spine. So now I want to move on to books that you might read if you are lost in the woods. So the kind of books that you would want to have in your backpack for such an eventuality of being lost in the woods imagining that you've got enough battery in your torch, which mine definitely doesn't have to last me for the night, um, to get you through that night and be able to read. But let's pretend that we can read in our cave or tent, if you're really lucky, 
or maybe in your shelter underneath a pine tree made of branches. Um, so what would you want to read if you were stuck in that situation? Well, I've got a few suggestions. So H.E. Bates's The Darling Buds of May is a really fabulously positive, uplifting, gorgeous book um, written in 1956. And it is all about a family, the Larkin family, Pop and Ma Larkin and their children, who live a rather idyllic seeming life on a farm. I think it's in Kent. And he wrote a few sequels to that. I think there were five in total. The third one is called When the Green Woods, When the Green Woods Laugh. And that's also a really gorgeous book. And that would be the one I'd probably take with me on my hike so that I, if I did get lost in the woods, I could read it. Because When the Green Woods Laugh, of course, makes you feel very positive about the woods and the fact that the woods are happy and a benign and positive, uh, upbeat place to be. And it's actually a very funny book because H.E. Bates is a very funny writer, comedy writer, um, in which Pop Larkin makes a profit by selling a dilapidated country mansion that he's acquired to a wealthy couple from London. He then has to fend off the romantic advances of one of their guests, Mrs. Perigo. Things take a more serious note when, after he rejects her approaches, she accuses him of assault and he ends up in court. So that is uh, the third in the series of The Darling Buds of May, When the Green Woods Laugh. And I think that would be a great one to have with you um, to make you feel happier about being lost in the woods. Another great one to have with you non-fiction would be Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard, which is Annie Dillard's personal narrative of one year's exploration on foot in the Virginia region through which Tinker Creek runs. In the summer, Dillard stalks muskrats in the creek and contemplates wave mechanics. In the fall, she watches a monarch butterfly migration and dreams of Arctic caribou. She tries to con a coot. She collects pond water and examines it under a microscope. She unties a snakeskin, witnesses a flood, and plays king of the meadow with a field of grasshoppers. The result is an exhilarating tale of nature and its seasons. She says, The answer must be, I think, that beauty and grace are performed whether or not we will or sense them. The least we can do is try to be there. So that's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which is a really lovely, um, upbeat, positive, non-fiction memoir about living in the wilderness. And there's many more of that ilk, um, living in the wilderness type books. But a couple of others which I would say you should definitely have in your backpack if you can take them with you are Hatchet by Gary Paulson, which I would imagine any of the American audience listening would know because it's a classic and amazing um, novel about a boy who gets lost in the woods because he's flying. I can't quite remember where he's leaving from and where he's going to, but he's on his way from his mum to go and visit his dad. Um, I think, as far as I recall, the parents are divorced. And while they're flying, he's, he's gone with a pilot, while they're flying over a lake in a very wooded area, the pilot has a heart attack and the boy and the plane crashes and the boy who's only 11 has to survive on his own. Luckily, his mother just gave him a hatchet, hence the title of the book. So he has this little hatchet with him. And that means that he can survive in the woods. The hatchet becomes his vital and essential friend. And it is a really brilliant tale of survival, which makes you feel that anything is possible and that you could survive as long as you've got your hatchet. So I guess we should add to our backpack a hatchet, which I hadn't mentioned before. And I think the, the hatchet described in this book is quite small. I think it's probably only about a 10 inch handle with a little axe head. Obviously, 
he could take that with him in his private aeroplane. Most of us wouldn't be able to take a hatchet with us in a plane these days. Uh, but I'm assuming that wherever we're going hiking, we're not flying to go there. We're actually leaving from our own front doors and going off into the wilderness. So take a hatchet with you and be inspired by Gary Paulson's book about survival because it's a really fantastic read and it's a great book for kids but also a great book for adults. And another one on a similar theme is uh, My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George which regular attenders to these evenings will know is one of my favourite children's books which is all about a boy who goes to live in the wilderness because he's really fed up of his seven brothers and sisters where he lives in a flat in New York and he decides to go off and live in the wilderness one day age 12 and his parents approve they let him go and um because that maybe things were different in the 1950s he's only 12 but you know he knows what he's doing and off he goes to live in the woods and he is a total survivor a lot of the way he survives is by going to the local library. So although he's gone into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, he does start off by going to a nearby town and hanging out in the library and finding out a few essential things like how to create a really good fire in the wilderness and how to catch fish. And so then he goes back into the wilderness with his knowledge and he does indeed catch fish. He also tames a, a falcon and he teaches the falcon to catch prey for him. So he's a very resourceful boy and he um, survives for over a year in the wilderness. There are sequels to the book, which I must admit I haven't read, but I absolutely love the first book, My Side of the Mountain, because it's a very positive, upbeat, hopeful book. And it's all about a boy surviving on his own in the wilderness and he manages and if you had that book in your backpack and you were reading it when you're lost in the woods you would feel in very good and capable hands with Sam Gribley who's the hero of the book and you would feel like you can indeed survive. So a couple of others that I would say would be great ones to have with you in your backpack are The Man Who Planted Trees by Jean Giono, which is a book that I often prescribe to people because it's such a calming, beautiful, um, anti-anxiety kind of book, which is all about a man who does actually have PTSD. He's come back from the war and he goes back to his home, the, the valley where he grew up in France, and he starts planting trees. He is the man who planted trees. And he goes out and he plants acorns all around the land where he lives because he wants to bring back life into the war-ravaged land. It's also got really lovely woodcut illustrations which make you feel very positive and calm as well. So that's The Man Who Planted Trees. Then another one, which I would also strongly recommend as a great read, either to have in your backpack or to have in your head, because um, that's another point that when you go on this hike, when you might get lost in the woods, if you've read a lot of fantastic novels and you've got them in your head, you can call on those in your hour of need which means you don't even necessarily have to have the torch because um, you might need to conserve those batteries. But if you remember the stories that you read, then you can relive them in your time of difficulty when you're shivering in the woods all alone, hoping that there aren't any bears about to join you. And for instance, this one would be a great one to have in your head or in your backpack. I'm saying maybe have it in your head because it's a hardback. But you can get it as a um, paperback too. So this is Etta and Otto and Russell and James by Emma Hooper. And it's a really 
great read which I would recommend to all, all about um, an 83 year old woman who decides one day to get up and walk from her home in Saskatchewan to the coast which is a 2,000 mile walk and off she goes. It's a complicated story because she is married but there's a man that is in love with her as well and while she walks she has many adventures. She goes through the wilderness, she goes through the woods and as she goes she picks up a coyote who's called James and this coyote becomes her companion and walks with her over many many um, terrains and through the woods and it's kind of a story of survival, it's a story of love and it's a story of being older as well and it's just a fantastic beautiful lovely read. I'm getting some people on Facebook saying that they love um, Jean Giono uh, which is great. Thank you David for uh, mentioning that and saying it's a true story which I, I do believe it is. Giono. Um, I never quite know how to pronounce his name. So yes I'm glad that you love that. It's a really fabulous book and definitely one to have in your armoury. That is one that you can definitely fit in your backpack. Look how small and slim it is. But also you can have it in your head like this one. So this is a great read. If you haven't read it yet I strongly urge you to do so because um, it's a lovely story and I think it's a great one with a older woman protagonist but also the, the men in the book Otto and Russell are really great characters too and they both have their own stories to tell as well and then of course there is the coyote who does give an element of um, magic realism because he can kind of talk to Etta who's the heroine of the story. So I wonder if you guys who are listening tonight, it, whether you have any books that you would say you you would like to have if you were lost in the woods or if you don't physically have those books would you have them in your head and if so what would those books be? So I've mentioned a few and I would also like to add that I would definitely have the Moomin books either with me or in my head because I love them. They are taking place in the woods because the Moomin characters who are all written by Tove Janssen, they live in the woods. They are so tiny that five of them can sit on a leaf but when you see the pictures of the Moomins they look kind of enormous. They look a bit like heffalumps but they're actually tiny little creatures and they're very friendly, they're very wise. The, the novels are full of wisdom and they're very warm and friendly and uh, the the vibe in the books is very family. They're all about family. Moom and Papa, Moom and Mama, they're kind of archetypal parents that we all wish we had. They're kind of the perfect parents who are ever nurturing although they also do have their faults. So the Moomin books are books I would definitely have with me either physically or mentally and I think that's something to remember is that it's really important to have books with you mentally even if you don't have them physically and that's why we should all read more as much as we possibly can so that you've always got those inner resources to fall back on. On that profound note I'm going to leave you for the evening so that I can get settled onto my bed of pines underneath my branches of the pine tree that are um, keeping me safe from the bears outside. Um, Nicola is just saying The Forager's Calendar by John Wright. That is a great and brilliant suggestion I have to say. Thank you for that. Um, we all need foraging books and we all need to be able to find mushrooms and to know which ones we can actually eat and which ones we can't. I think this would be one 
that might take you on some interesting journeys if you were to eat it. Um, so, yes, books of survival are particularly useful as well. Uh, and there would definitely be a few practical suggestions there. But also that's why My Side of the Mountain is such a great book, because that is a book of survival, even though it's fiction. And Hatchet uh, by Gary Paulson. So thanks so much for joining me tonight, everyone. I'm going to end it here to, so as to preserve my voice for tomorrow when I will be seeing Natalie Haynes at the London Library, um, putting her under the covers and giving her a live bibliotherapy session. Um, maybe some of you might be joining me there. And I hope to come back next week. It, um, I'll let you know. I may not be able to due to family commitments, but I will post on Facebook and Instagram and tell you what's going on. And don't forget, you can always book a bibliotherapy session one-to-one -one with me by sending me an email and or contacting me on Facebook or Instagram. And um, bibliotherapy sessions also make an excellent gift for loved ones. So thanks so much. Great to see you. And I will hopefully see you next week. Good night.